Today, I want to focus on something that uh, we just published in a couple of weeks ago in uh, Archaeological Discovery Journal. And uh, this is uh, our new paper, The Bearded Lady of Giza, Appropriation Conspiracy and Veiled Protests in the Pyramid of Unas. This is a long paper. Uh, there's a lot of new ideas, a lot of new evidence, um, but I want to focus on one aspect of this paper, which is maybe uh, a little bit more on the controversial side, and that has to do with our proposal that the antechamber of the Pyramid of Unas, and I'm just scrolling down to a graphic so I can explain the problem. So the proposal here is that uh, the antechamber of the Pyramid of Unas and the connecting corridor to the burial chamber and the Serdab with uh, the three alcoves, this all is an architectural simulation of the Great Sphinx in Giza. Now, of course, the Pyramid of Unas in Saqqara, it's about 14 kilometer, kilometers south of Giza where the Sphinx is. And uh, in the paper, the first inkling that Robert Nalen and I had that there is potentially such a thing going on that the architect and composer of the pyramid text wanted to simulate the interior of the Great Sphinx is uh, this very first column here on the, on, the, on the south side of the connecting corridor. And specifically, what we find there is that the very end of the uh, the offering ritual, which is in the burial chamber, and it ends in this column here. And the very last words of the of, of the offering ritual is "sedge uh, desherui," which base, which literally trans Alan translates as smashing the redware, the two red jars. But interestingly, sedge also means tail, and desherui would mean the red, the two red ones. So the tail of the two red ones, it's an interesting alternative translation only because we have an orphanized column here. We have a column that is all by itself. It belongs to a different part of the pyramid text from the rest of what's written here. So these 18 columns of text belong to the resurrection ritual. And what we're looking at here is the southern wall of the connecting corridor. So the first column here is the last column of the offering ritual. And then what we have here is a completely different part of the pyramid text. And this was kind of odd. So it's an orphanized column. It's, it serves as the tail end, and the pun is intended, of the offering ritual. And the very end, interestingly, even has an alternative translation that reminds you of, uh, that says tail. And the red ones is an epithet of the lion. So when I saw this, I thought to myself, is it possible that we have a textual architectural uh, simulation here of, of the Great Sphinx statue? There's other reasons why I thought that, but we don't have to get into this right now. So I was already primed to see something like that. But when I saw this, I thought to myself, I'm gonna have to put this to a test. And this is what I want to do now with you in this video. I want to flesh this out a little bit and show you some additional evidence that we, for space restrictions, didn't, um, weren't able to put into this paper. Uh, so, so let me close. Let me close this here. Uh, we're going to get back to the pyramid text in just a moment, but uh, we're going to close this for now. So let me just. Uh, take you on a tour one more time. I, I always do this just to orient people because they may not have been inside the pyramid. So this is virtual UNAS, courtesy of the Egypt uh, Exploration Society. This is a great tool because it allows you to visit the interior without actually being in Egypt. So, uh, and I don't want to give you vertigo, but so let's, uh, let's go into the entry corridor. So this is, the, the staircase, when you're coming down from the outside into the Pyramid of Unas, this is not a very long walk. You can still see the light, the daylight, and this is the north. So we're coming in from the north 
into the pyramid. Here's the the uh, here are the slots for the portcullis stones, three of them. And so we're walking into the break into the uh, into the Unas pyramid. And what we have here then is the beginning uh, of the text. But this is actually the end of the pyramid text. So what you're looking at here are the very last few columns of the entire corpus of the pyramid text of Unas. Uh, and this here is what comes just before that. So we're basically walking in on the end of the entire pyramid text. So what we have here now is we're looking south. This is the antechamber. This is the south, south wall. This is the east wall. This is the east gable of the antechamber. This is the serdab I mentioned. This goes into three alcoves, which have no, no writing in the Pyramid of Unas. Here on the right, which is the west, is the west wall. There's the gable. Uh, the west gable of the antechamber, and here behind us is the north wall. Um, so the texts come out of the come out of the burial chamber through the corridor. So they come from here. This is the ending of the the resurrection ritual. It ends here, and then the texts go up into the gable. You read them from north to south. Uh, then you read the uh, the antechamber west wall again from north to south. The texts continue over into the south wall, and uh, and from here they go up into the gable here into the east gable. This is the famous cannibal hymn. Most of this, uh, the cannibal hymn finishes approximately here, uh, and then we have the first couple of spells of the uh, uh, spells against inimical beings, um, and so that continues over here on the east wall and then this is where this portion of the pyramid text ends um, presumably this is now where one aspect of the deceased ascends into the sky into the eastern sky with uh, sunrise uh, and uh, with uh, the rising of horakti which presumably is a, a line in the sky uh, at least according to Robert Bouval. And so here on the north side, then we have a different chapter, the final chapter of the pyramid text, where we now talk about the Ba of the deceased. Uh, the texts go down into this corner. And then, as I said, they finish by, I'm sorry, you go, you go, from, uh, you go from south to north. So you're reading the text, you finish the text by reading this way and by reading that way. And then the end of it is right here. Um, so this is just a, a quick review of the antechamber. In the burial chamber, in the burial chamber, we have the beginning of the pyramid text up here in the gable, the west gable. Uh, the text then move to the north wall. Here we have the uh, the uh, offering ritual, as I mentioned, in three registers, each fifty-five columns. Uh, the offering ritual continues here at the end of the east wall and then as i mentioned and then it continues into the corridor on the south wall and then it finishes as i mentioned here in the first column where you have the the tail of the red ones or the smashing of the red wear according to uh, jim allen uh, so once the offering ritual is completed then the texts go up into the gable and this is the response to the offering ritual over here and when this is finished, then comes the resurrection ritual. And the resurrection ritual is written into the south wall. It begins up here. You read across the corner all the way over here to, to the place where we have a, a section that belongs to the offering ritual, if you remember. So the, uh, the resurrection ritual goes approximately here, this column, if I'm not mistaken. And then it uh, completes as I mentioned before in the corridor. So the resurrection ritual picks up here in the second column and it finishes here with the word gods. Uh, so this is kind of a quick review of the interior layout of the pyramid texts in the two chambers and the connecting corridor. Um, and so what I wanna do now is I'm gonna show you uh, the view of this, this, uh, corridor wall and then I'm going to show you this entire wall here so the the total number of columns 
that we have here is 19. And over here on the antechamber south wall, we have 43 text columns. So keep that in mind, that's 62 total columns. And this will become important in just a moment. So what we're gonna do now is leave the virtual UNAS and we're gonna go to a different view. Uh, and that is this. So you have to now imagine uh, that you are looking from the south into the chamber. So you are facing here, you're facing the north wall. This is the three registers as I just, there's the coffin. Here's the three registers of the north wall with the offering ritual. To the left is west, to the right is east. Here's the antechamber north. And here's the connecting corridor north. So we basically cut away the entire south section of the interior architecture. And what I have done here now below, we're gonna skip over the Sphinx for a second, is here now you're looking at the other wall from the outside. And that's why this is site inverted, right? Normally these symbols are facing to the east, but I inverted it because we're looking from the outside in. And so this is basically the south wall of the antechamber. And this is the south wall of the connecting corridor, but we're not looking from the inside out. We're looking from the outside in, which is why the symbols are facing uh, in the opposite direction. And of course, the reason why I did this is because I want to overlay these two walls with the Great Sphinx Monument to see how there is a correlation potentially between the statue, the physical aspects of the statue and the text. And remember the model that we're proposing here is that the antechamber is, a, is simulating the statue. So uh, let me now show you uh, a couple of interesting pieces of evidence that uh, support this model. So the first one, of course, is the tail comment at the end of the, with the, uh, the offering ritual, which I already mentioned. So in this case, it's the first column on the left side. So this is in the correcting in the connecting corridor south. Here is the, the smashing of the, the, the two red wares or the tail of the red ones in my reconstruction as an alternative read. And so that would correspond to the tail section of, that would correspond to, and I just lost the picture. So I don't know why it just closed. Uh, let me see if I can find it. I think it is, I know what I did. Forgive me for just a moment. I have to resurrect this image. Yeah, I turned the mouse wheel and so the images went, uh, I guess I went backwards to this one, yeah. Oh, it's just taking a lot of time to open up. This is a, a large file. It's a PNG file I made here because I want to be able to zoom in and still have a good resolution. Okay, uh, sorry about that. So. Uh, anyway, so let me let me now first of all show you the, the elevations of the statue. So this is uh, this is prepared by Uli Kapp, that was uh, the surveyor that was working with Mark Lehner uh, in the late seventies and early eighties when they um, surveyed the Great Sphinx, and out of this work, of course, came Mark Lehner's PhD thesis, uh, the Archaeology of an Image. And so this is a very nice uh, illustration because it shows us the length of the statue. Uh, these are the survey distances uh, from, from an arbitrary control point, 500 meters. And so what we have here is basically 503. So you can think of this as the beginning of the statue at 503. And then 
the entire length of the statue goes to 575 and change. So this is about 72 meters long, including the masonry. The, uh, the core statue without the masonry is just over 71 meters. So a little bit of the thickness comes from the masonry. So, uh, so the statue is 72 meters, we can say with, and, and a little bit of change. And so what I have marked here is the great fissure that the, uh, the width on, in, this, in this view of the, of the major fissure, which cuts through the, the monument. And to give you an idea, this is, of course, the repaired statue. This was repaired by uh, Emile Barres uh, in the, in the mid-1920s. And they cemented this up basically, but this was the fissure and the fissure cut basically to the front portion of the hind paw of the southern hind paw and then it cut through this uh, the ditch here and it went all the way uh, across to the enclosure wall. Um, and that's what you're looking at here, so the cut is kind of going this way so here's the here is the, the limit the, the limits of the cut and this is. Approximately runs from. 15 to 18 meters from from the tail section so 15 to 18 meters now what i have done is i basically matched the corridor and the southern wall so remember 62 columns uh, against the 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 torso of the statue all the way back to the tail ending and of course why because the the four paws we think is simulated by the Serdab and the alcove. So that would be included in this text here because, uh, because remember here is the, here's the antechamber east wall, here's the gable. And on this wall, we actually find several invocations uh, that are uh, referring to features of the, the front of the Great Sphinx. So, so what I have done here basically is basically run the eastern wall, the eastern limit of the southern wall against the breastplate of the Great Sphinx. And so when you do that, uh, you notice that the, the major fissure ends pretty much where the corridor ends. So this is an interesting second correlate between the chamber system and the statue. So there's a fairly nice correspondence, um, but there is something that, but there is more. Um, for example, if you, if you uh, calculate the distance from here to there, so we're talking about 55 meters, a little bit over 55 meters, and we compare that to the length of this in, in cubits or in meters regardless, you come up with a pretty close 12 to one scale. So in other words, the statue, from here to there is about 12 times as long as the chamber from here to here. Uh, now, I wanna show you something before I show you the, some more textual evidence for this simulation here. So um, for that, we have to go to another image and that is a stela that was found by Selim Hassan around the Sphinx. And so I have to open this up. Let me see where that is. Yeah, it's here. Okay. So this is a New Kingdom stela. And on this, this is one of many. And many of them show this sort of image. You see the Sphinx with a humanized head. And you see this, this uh, flower or this umbrella standing over the, the back of the, of the Great Sphinx. And this is a symbol of Shu. You can, it could be interpreted as the shadow, it could be interpreted as air. Uh, Shu is, of course, the god of uh, air, and he's the consort of Tefnut. So Shu is air, Tefnut is moisture, and Shu and Tefnut are sometimes thought of as two aspects of the lion deity or two lions, Ruti. 
uh, and they were in the heliopolity and cosmogony, they were the first children of uh, Atum. So, um, and when you now look, so this, interestingly, this, this shoe, this shadow symbol is sitting over, approximately over this, where the fissure cuts through the hind paw, right? And so now if we go back to this uh, overlay that I just showed you, so we would expect a reference to Shu somewhere in this section. And the interesting thing is, you actually do have a reference to the god Shu in the very first column of the antechamber south. And that, that reference is right here, there's Shu. So this is the first column. Now we're looking from the, the we're looking at the correct way of the uh, of the south wall. So the symbols are facing to the west because you're reading this way from west to east. And this is the first column of the antechamber east wall. I'm sorry, southern wall. And at the very bottom of it, you have the word shoe. This is basically the context of this is that Unas is being judged by by the two uh, Ma'ot, uh, the Ma'oti. Ma'oti are the two Ma'ots, the two orders, the two uh, principles of uh, cosmic harmony. And, uh, and Shu is in attendance. So Ayu, Shu, and then the text goes up here and saying that he's a witness. So Shu is a witness. Uh, so the interesting thing is that we have the mention of Shu where we would expect it in the general area where, and it's actually in the very first column. So that's fairly significant, I would say, uh, right after the corridor. And that is where the major fissure ends. And that is of course, where in depictions of the Sphinx, you see, uh, you see, you see an actual, symbol that's representing shoe, shadow, air, etc. So I think this is fascinating that we have this second uh, correspondence, but there's more. And that has to do with another part of the paper that we, uh, that we propose. So what we're saying, so here's another view of the hind portion. Uh, and of course, the hind portion has significance in terms of symbolic meaning because it means it's the symbol for Heka, the, the inv invocative language of the ancient Egyptians. Um, but I wanted to show you now another, another thing about and that has to do with the centipede. So it turns out that there's two mentions of the centipede. So here's the major fissure. We're looking now from the statue of the Great Sphinx, Tals, the southern enclosure wall. There's the, there's the centipede. And so we're proposing here is that the ancient, ancient Egyptians believed that this cut through the Sphinx ditch is a centipede. Okay. And you might think, well, that's that's kind of a bizarre proposal, but it turns out that there is a there's a uh, there's a record of the ancient Egyptians, a proven actually instance of the ancient Egyptians uh, believing that a, a natural formation is uh, is a god, and that had and that's in uh, in Nubia where you have uh, you have a mountain, the mountain has a, a pedicle, a huge pedicle, and the ancient Egyptians thought that this is a cobra head and they thought that this is the Uraeus. And so this entire mountain became a holy mountain. And this, we know this for a fact because inside of the mountain is a, uh, is a, uh, a temple, part, the temple is partially carved into the mountain. And there you can see a depiction of the mountain with, uh, with the Uraeus snake, the cobra uh, coming out of it. So we know for sure that they think, they thought this natural formation is a divine symbol. And so we think that uh, the same applies over here, that they believe that this is a centipede. I mean, if we had, we didn't just pull this out of the hat. There's several hints in the pyramid text that suggest that this might be the case. 
And uh, I don't have time to get into all of that. I just wanted to uh, show you some supporting evidence that this idea that this may be a centipede actually represents uh, a strike, some kind of natural disaster that uh, split this entire area. And one of those one of those things could be a lightning strike, a strong, of course, lightning strike that would basically cut this whole area here with the, the rock of the enclosure of the ditch and 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 of course the Great Sphinx. And this cut goes all the way to the other side as well. So it cut the monument in uh, in half. And and to the ancient Egyptians, that was a mark of divinity. And that's why they gave, in our, in our proposal, they gave this, uh, they represented this as the centipede. And now I want to show you something which is rather remarkable that supports that very idea. And so when you now go back to this graphic, so remember what I showed you. So here's the major fissure up on the monument and the cut goes sort of like this through the, the, the hind paw, the frontal aspect of the hind paw, and then it continues sort of diagonally forward to the enclosure wall. And now look in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, just about at that level, we have actually a mention of lightning strikes. Okay. So uh, these lightning strikes are, and I can, I'm going to show this to you close up because it's so important. So for that, I am going to go to back to this. So this is uh, Pian Alexander Pionkov's uh, pyramid text survey. And these are photos that were taken by Natasha Rambova. These are, these are the best photos I've seen of the pyramid text. So this is the upper right-hand corner of the antechamber south wall. So here's the first column, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And look, there we have we have lightning strikes. Okay, so the the word is uh, hen henbu henbu is lightning lightning bolts. Henbu is lightning bolt. So so we have two we have two mention two invocations now. We have we have Shu, where we where the upper portion of the fissure of the major fissures on the statue. That's where the shadow symbol is, as shown on Stila from the New Kingdom. And then in the ninth, in the ninth column, we have a mention of lightning bolts, and that is where uh, the lower aspect of the. That's where the lower aspect of the uh, the major fissure runs, basically right here, and of course we think that lightning bolt, that damage caused by the lightning bolt was believed to be a divine centipede. And there are more details about this. I don't have time to get into it, but we describe it in the paper. It's figure 27. Um, there's other mentions of the centipede. So here, for example, on the antechamber east wall. Uh, and here's uh, another mention which I'll give you the, the general idea. It turns out that there was a, a divine road. This is mentioned on the dream steel also uh, in front of the Sphinx, a divine road that goes to Heliopolis and it goes to Babylon, which is uh, uh, Aha in Egyptian in hieroglyphic. And so, so I was wondering why is it a divine road? Well, I mean, it goes to Rostau but what is it specifically about Rostov? Well, it turns out that you have you have the Wat Sepa, you have the, the way of the centipede, okay? So I think the reason why this road is divine is because of the strike, because of this special mark of divinity inside of the Sphinx ditch. And to the ancient Egyptians, this was something special. It marked this as a holy place. And of course we know that uh, that this place is sacred to the ancient Egyptians. It says so on the dream stela because it goes back to Zeptepi the first time. 
Um, anyway, so let me go back to, let me go back to the, the graphic because there's uh, one other thing I wanted to show you. Uh, so, and if you remember from Robert Bouval's work in uh, most recently in Origins of the Sphinx, he was looking for an old kingdom reference to the great Sphinx, that this is an enigma why the greatest statue in the world didn't have a mention for over a thousand years uh, since it was presumably made by, by King Khafre. Of course, we think that was something there before, and that is part of the problem. That explains why the statue was no longer being mentioned or why it wasn't mentioned after Khafre, because it was taboo, and the cult of the Sphinx hadn't really manifest uh, too well yet. Um, but there is a cryptic mention of the statue, which is Horemachet. We know Horemachet is the name of the great Sphinx in the New Kingdom. And, but there is no such name, Horemachet, in the pyramid texts in the Old Kingdom. However, there is a mention of Horachti. So Horachti is mentioned. And for that, I have to go back to, I have to go back to Piankov. So let me show you where Horachti is mentioned. So. Pionkov's images are split up. So this is, uh, this is the beginning of the south wall. This is the upper portion. This is the lower portion. And then this is now where we go to the central portion. So, and there's a little bit of duplication. So we are in column, I believe this is column 13 again, and this is 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, uh, 20, 21, and this is where we see a mention of Horachti. So uh, uh, let me just see where it is. Uh, oh, it's a little bit hard to find, but uh, here's the mention of the, the boat, the day boat and the night boat. Maybe it's further down. Yeah, here it is, okay. Here's Horachti. So it's explicitly meant, Horachti is explicitly mentioned. And Robert Bouval interpreted this mention of Horachti as the Sphinx in the sky. So he thought this is the constellation Leo at which the great, the statue of the great Sphinx is staring uh, in the summer solstice during the old kingdom, right? When the, when the sun rose north of due east, it basically arose into the constellation Leo. And, and Robert Bouval thought that this is Horachti, but there's no mention of Horemachet. Well, it turns out that we think we have found a cryptic mention of Horachti, and that is, I have to take you back now up the paper, uh, that is over here. So this is the south wall. Um, this green light is sort of, it, the reason why we put that here is to show you the connection between the two mentions of Horachti, here's Horachti, uh, and here is the cryptic mention of Horem Achet. So this, this text here, it says, Sek Unas Per M Heru Pen. So it means now Unas comes forth on this day in the true form of an Ach, right? And within that sentence is hidden, uh, the, the word uh, heru, so heru em ach, hor, horos in the horizon, hor em ach, uh, And that is in, in the beginning of this southern wall to the, to the west side, okay? So this is immediately after the mention of shu. Here's the, here's shu. Okay, and then in the third column, we have this invocation of Hor Machet. So if we go back now and we look at, uh, we look at our drawing. So, uh, so this is the hind portion, the major fissure. As soon as the major fissure is over, we have the main body and front of the Great Sphinx. Okay, that's the main statue. And that is where we now invocate the name of the statue, Hor Machet. Okay, so it makes perfect sense. 
uh, as soon as we pass the fissure and we have the actual statue now, that is when we have the name of the real statue. And so it's the third column. So it's over here. Um, it's a little bit difficult right, because I'm inverting the symbols, but you can see it. It's, uh, it's right here. Uh, it says um, sec unas per heru per, per m heru pen uh, ayaru mao ach. So it means now unas emerges on this day in the true form of an ach, and in that sentence is hiding or mach at the statue. So we have multiple pieces of evidence, as I showed you, that we that the chamber, the text is positioned in such a way to invocate features of the statue or the name of the statue in, a, uh, in an appropriate, architecturally appropriate manner. So it's brilliantly done. And of course, I think it's intentional, but of course you have to prove the point. It's, you know, one, one piece of evidence is not enough. So we have the tail, but it has to be corroborated. And I think um, when you do this overlay, you get a nice corroboration of the, the fact that this statue was being, uh, was being simulated by the architecture, but not just the architecture, but even the text. The text is helping. It's basically underpinning the architecture. Um, and it is, this, it is mentioning certain features. And of course, this theme continues. Uh, we have several features of the Great Sphinx mentioned, invocated on the Eastern Wall. It's all described in the paper, and I'm not going to get into it right now. Um, but um, I just wanted to um, I just wanted to show this to you how cleverly this was done by the composer and art. He obviously whoever designed the interior architecture knew exactly where he wanted to put the text. Uh, it had to be topographically precise. It had to be accurately placed in such a way that it um, that it amplifies the architecture. And I'm saying he because we have a suspect uh, and it's not a she, it's a he, it's his name was Aihi and Aihi was the vizier of Unas. Um, and we get into that at the end of the paper. Um, I just wanted to mention it real quick. Uh, Aihi, we think left his signature at in, uh, in, the, uh, in the East Gable of the antechamber. So up here, it says Aihi. Of course, it is used in a different context. It's used uh, cloudy, obscured, but it's a wordplay. Um, and there's some reasons, there's the, the explanation why we think that this is a signature by the co-author uh, has to do with what happens uh, on, in the last column of the south wall of the antechamber. And we don't have to get into it right now. Um, anyway, so I think uh, that's it for today. Um, I. I'm going to leave the comment section open. I think you're going to have some questions about this, I'm sure. So um, if you have any questions, go ahead and I'll try to answer them as best as I can and as quickly as I can.